Our next speaker, Mike Barra, uh, a friend and colleague of many years, it's good to see him again. Um, in fact, we were just talking about seeing each other about 10 years ago in Roswell. Um, he's going to be talking about his new book, A Hidden Agenda, and the secret space program, and whatever else he wants to. Please give a warm welcome from Seattle to Mike Barra. Thank you, Peter. How is everybody today? Good? Good. Glad to be here in Salem. You're all East Coasters, right? So you're kind of from around here. Ooh, this is going to slide. I can't lean on it. Um, I'm just going to wait until we're sure we have the slideshow going. But we can talk about other things. Um, yeah, I met uh, Peter. Introduced, the first public speaking thing I ever did in 2007 was in Roswell. And Peter introduced me then uh, when Dark Mission had come out, the book I wrote with Richard, Richard C. Hoagland. Um, back in 2007, which was very successful. You like that book? Yeah, it's good. The Secret, it's Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. So I got, I think I had two or three copies of that one back in the vendor room. And a few copies of the other ones uh, that I've written, some of the other ones. And I just want to say, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, full, it's a full circle kind of thing, um, 10 years later to be doing this. I can't believe I've actually been doing this for 10 years, but I'm, it's really been satisfying. For those of you who don't know who I am, I've uh, been on Ancient Aliens for a number of years since season two. Um, off and on, they're kind of like, I'm not being used as much as I used to be, but hey, I'm not going to complain about it. Um, and I've done some other shows. There was a show called Uncovering Aliens, <clears throat> which was a reality show for Discovery Channels back in 2014, and that's how I met Tom Reed. Tom was one of the cases we investigated. We did four, we shot six episodes, they cut four, and it still plays once in a while on Discovery. It'll be on, on the American Heroes Network, or it'll be on Animal Planet. They're the ones who originally bought the show. And uh, that was really fun, and it was just, you know, when I met Tom, and Tom just seemed like a very sincere, convincing guy, he and his brother, and so that's how we kind of became friends. and. Um, I really I thought about it. I thought we should really have shown, uh, just shown that episode because it's Tom's case is pretty intriguing. There we go. We're almost there now. All right, we're close. <laughs> Great. Okay, we're off and running, and I'm going to try to talk really fast so that I can beat the battery. Okay, uh, my name is Mike Barra. I'm up here for Paraween. I'm glad you guys are here. We got to keep uh, this thing going, expand it into the future. Um, primarily, I'm an author. I've been lucky to do some TV. My first book was Dark Mission with Richard C. Hoagland. I have a book called The Choice, which is about physics and spirituality and how 2012 was going to shift our ways of thinking. And one of the things I implied in that, one of the things I told everybody was that things are going to get really weird politically between 2012 and 2023. And gosh, have things gotten a little weird here lately? I don't know. And we're also going to have some, some changes in our money hierarchies and how money is distributed. And the way we look at money is going to become under pressure here. Ancient Aliens on the Moon, which is about stuff, including pyramids that you can see on the moon. A couple of books on Mars, the same thing, the face on Mars, pyramids on Mars, all kinds of ruins, some great pictures in there. Ancient Aliens and Secret Societies is the one I did in 2015, which is kind of connecting the secret societies that had influenced and infiltrated NASA and where they came from and who started them. And the answer is, the short answer is, aliens. Marduk. Marduk, the Anunnaki god who was actually the son of... Um, uh, Enki, one of Enki's sons, is the guy who started the first secret society schools. And they were meant to guide us along to our, our path of enlightenment. But they, after he left Earth, they were usurped by these evil people. Is there a kid in here? I thought I saw a young man in here. OK, well, I, so I can say F for a while until he gets back, right? And, and so that's what Secret Societies is all about. Um, and then my new book, the current one, is Hidden Agenda, which is NASA and the Secret Space Program. What I wanted to do with this one is to connect the dots. Because you hear you, there's a lot of stories out there about the Secret Space Program, that there's a separate. Dolan probably talked about breakaway civilization. He likes to use that word. I think it's his term. You know, of people taking this technology secret and running off and hiding with it. And is there, and, and I thought, okay, is there really any evidence that there is in fact a secret space program? What is the evidence? Because we have a lot of people out there that are talking about it that unfortunately don't have any evidence for the stories they tell. They tell wonderful stories, they're very full of detail, they're very popular, but they're not very substantive. So I thought, what's the substance? What can we put together? And, um, and really come to a conclusion that yes, this in fact is something that happened. So I'll be talking about that a little bit later, um, but I wanted to start with some other stuff. One of the things I'd want to say was, 
you know, if you buy books for people, and really a lot of us, that's our lifeblood. We live on books. If we have a book, that helps us get on TV, which helps us get our story out, which then gets us to lectures, which then gets us to talk to you guys. And one of the things that's really important is if, for instance, Amazon, which is a really important site, um, you can see that there's this guy here, at S. Harris. Uh, he thinks I don't know what his real name is. I know what his real name is. He's a psychopath, and he hates me. And he, of course, gives everything a one-star rating without ever reading it. That's okay. That's normal. I mean, if you're, if you're successful in some way, you're going to have people coming after me after you. It's not a big deal. But whether you like my stuff or Nick Redfern's stuff or Dolan's stuff or, or you know, whoever's written a book, David Wilcock, one of the things that's important to understand is that when you go to Amazon, if you like the book, please give it a good review. It doesn't have to be this long. It can only be a couple of sentences, but give it a good review, and that helps. The other thing is if you see somebody posting a bad review and you don't agree with it, don't react to it. Because see down here it says, uh, what, you know, does this, uh, how many people, uh, these people found this comment helpful. Was this helpful to you? And it tries to prompt you to say yes or no. It really doesn't care whether you found it helpful. All it does is that whether you say yes or no or report it, or make a comment about the review, like, oh, you're so full of it. You know, I've talked to the guy, he knows what he's talking about. It basically takes the most active reviews and puts them to the top. So the first thing that a viewer or a reader comes in and sees is a negative interview. So my, what I'd like to ask you to do is if you are going to go in and post a review or you're going to look at other people's reviews, do not click on the negative ones. Just click on the positive ones. Say yes, say no, you know, what, make comments, whatever. That will help all of the authors in the community get their books put up. And, and the higher they are in the rankings, the better the reviews, the more Amazon will advertise them to people that are just coming to visit Amazon. So that would be very helpful. Um, and I have a website. It's called Mike. It's just mikebarrow.blogspot.com. That is uh, that is a picture when I was a little skinnier. And uh, we're going to try to get back to that next year sometime. But uh, you know, um, that was from 2011. So um, it wasn't that long ago. Come on. Um, and you know, there I've got connections to all my YouTube stuff, uh, upcoming appearances, bio. I may not have too many upcoming appearances with the things I've been talking about lately, which we will get into. So. To get started, I know Dolan talked a little bit about politics, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. I'm also going to give you a slightly different perspective because I think what's going on politically in the country is really, really important for us in the UFO community because what we're talking about or what we've been hoping for for years and years and years is just is what we call disclosure, right? Steve Bass's big thing, government disclosure. Don't really think it's ever going to happen, but I will say this. I think with the current president, we have a better chance of it happening than we have ever had of any of the other cabal presidents, Bush one, Clinton one, Bush two, Obama, the almost Clinton two that we had, those people were never going to tell you the truth because they're all part of the DC swamp, what, what, what Trump is now calling the swamp. So I am hopeful that Trump is going to be different. And it, it's important. I, I realize some people hate the guy's guts and I understand where they're coming from. I understand their perspective. I don't, I don't necessarily feel the same way. But what I, would what I would tell you is, is that he, what I think he is doing is what he was hired to do. He has been given a role in the changes that are coming. And I will simply say, look at what happened yesterday, where he said, the CIA, the FBI, the, people, the same people that try to shut us down and keep us from talking about Roswell and UFOs and aliens, he said, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to release the JFK documents on his assassination. Now, I don't know if there's going to be anything intriguing in there in, um, in uh, secret societies and dark mission. I talk about what I think, why I think Kennedy was really killed. They may not, it may not reveal that. It may not say that that is absolutely factual, but it, at least we're going to have a shot at reading some of the stuff that's in there. So um, almost a year ago, we had an election. And it did not go the way some people thought it was going to go. It went, um, it made the establishment unhappy. So one of the things when I look at Trump, I look at it and I say to myself, well, who's against this guy? The people that are against this guy are the CIA, the FBI, the State Department establishment, the so-called deep state establishment, the Defense Department guys, the bankers are against him, the Republican Establishment Party is against him, the Democratic Party is against him, and the corporate-owned media is against him. So when I see that, I say to myself, I think I'm going to vote for this guy, just simply for that reason, regardless of what he said on tape 11 years ago. That was my perspective. So um, 
It didn't go well for some people. They got very upset. <laughs> Bye. Um, look, truth, you know, look, I'm just talking about what I think is going on. And they're going to miss some really important stuff here because they didn't stick through this. So, you know, it didn't go well. People were unhappy about it. And the resistance has been amazing, really, over the last year. There's been this constant, there's rioting going on in the streets. There's all this stuff. A lot of it's financed by other people. Um, there's the new resistance movement. Resistance is futile because Trump is not the front man. He is being backed by other people. And it's really interesting when you start looking at who the other people are. Here is the inauguration. We all heard about this story, right? It is inauguration. And Trump said it was the biggest inauguration crowd ever, ever which is his typical bombast. Um, and the media showed this picture compared to um, and compared it to Obama's, which was completely packed. The thing is, is that um, this picture was actually taken like two hours before the inauguration, not during the inauguration. This is the actual inauguration photo. Um, this is the same area that's not filled in here. So again, the interesting thing to me is not how many people Trump had, whether he had more people than Obama, which was really not a possibility. Um, the interesting thing is that the is the way the media portrayed it. They kept using this picture for months after that, claiming that was his crowd, which it's not, it's this. Um, so Trump gets in and what does he do? He starts <laughs> rewriting everything. Yeah, I know, these are just memes I pulled off the internet. You know, get rid of this Obama policy, get rid of that Obama policy. He's canceled 45,000 regulations that have been put in in the last eight years, which hopefully has helped the economy a little bit. He starts immediately doing this stuff People are hating on him. They're saying he's Hitler. You know, as you can see, Trump and Hitler both drank water. So we now know that, that Trump must be Hitler because he drinks water. Um, they're saying he's in bed with Vladimir Putin. I wish those folks had stayed because, uh, because I was definitely, I would admit, I'm making fun of him too. As I'm watching these things, I knew that there was something really strange you know, going on, because you could tell, because he wasn't being treated like any other president had ever been treated. And of course, he seemed to love that. He invited that he brought it upon himself with his tweets and his attacks on people and all that kind of stuff. And I thought to myself, what what is really going on here in terms of, is, is this just simple political jealousy? Because the truth is, you could, um, there we go. You could, um, you, yeah. You, <laughs> It's actually Putin's body on both of them, so I don't think Putin's really any more buff than Donald on that one. Um, but there was stuff going on that was extraordinary. Like, this is a guy from the Huffington Post passing out Russian flags at the Conservative Political Action Committee meeting, trying to make it look like the people at CPAC were waving Russian flags. Uh, there's been this whole thing, the evidence against them. Now, th this is interesting what happened, too, just the other day, which is that now um, what's the, the Clinton, they're, they're discovering that the Clintons actually were behind, very much influential on the sale of 20% of the United States' uranium reserves to Russia. That Putin's government paid the Clinton Foundation $145 million. And John Podesta, who was built, um, her, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, was involved to the tune of $30 million with a Russian company. So they are finding collusion they're just finding it all on Hillary's side. So is that why the media and Hillary are pushing the Trump-Russia thing so much? And you know, there was a, a, an opinion put out that I thought was really interesting, an analysis piece about how Robert Mueller, who's the special prosecutor, his job was never to pin Trump to Russia. His job was to cover up what was going on with the Clintons and Russia, which may in fact be true, because what's going on with Trump doesn't make any sense in the context of, if you get a president and you don't like, what do you do? You just stonewall him for four years. You make him ineffective, he loses the next election, you're done with him. Everybody is so focused on getting rid of him as fast as possible, I'm thinking, what is it about this guy that's so threatening? And as I started to look for signs and symbols, um, yeah, Dianne Feinstein. You know, this, was li this literally was a real headline. President gets two scoops of ice cream, everybody else gets one. That was a real CNN, that's a real screen cap from CNN. To the point there, there's, when, when Trump was passing out aid for Hurricane Harvey, you know, there's this black lady there and he's patting her on the face and, and they had a fake CNN headline, you know, Trump slaps black woman. And he's handing out food and it was Trump steals food from family, you know. It was, it was ridiculous, right? It's gotten ridiculous. Ivanka sort of, tro you know, trolled him back. Uh, after that, and but, but but what's happening is there's a bigger thing going on here, which does ultimately have to do with us, and you know 
what's going on is there is another system. There's something else going on. There is some other thing happening there. I see Trump as historical, as a historical figure. I see him as similar to Caesar. What Caesar was trying to do was to not, he didn't, he was, didn't believe in republics or democracy, Caesar didn't. He wanted to be a dictator, but people loved him. They loved his bombastic attitude. He'd had a lot of success as Trump had success in business. And he sought to make himself king, and the people that were opposed to him were all of the establishment patrician class. So I kind of see the same thing going on with them in terms of a historical perspective. So as I watched all these events evolve, I, I started watching the inauguration very closely, looking for signs. That's what Dark Mission is all about in secret societies. What are the signs? What's going on? And he made a statement, and right when he went to make this statement during the inaugural speech, all of the members of the various military branches, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, there's one other one, came out and stood behind him right when he uttered these words. What truly matters is not which party controls our government, but whether our government is controlled by the people. January 20th, 2017 will be remembered as the day that the people became the rulers of this nation again. Those are not his words. He is speaking and backed up by those guys back there. And what they're saying is, that there is another government behind the government that we see. Now, what is that government? That government is the United States Republic. The United States of America was founded as a republic in 1776. In 1789, we got the Constitution. A constitution is a document of, is a financial document. It is not a political document. It is not, it is not like, the Magna Carta. It says a constitutor is someone who secures the debt of another. So what essentially happened was is that we kind of then became less of a republic and more of a democracy, meaning in a re here's what happens in a republic. In a republic, yeah, the other day I got backed into by a lady. Okay, she backed into my car with her car. In a republic, she gets out, she says, oh dang, I'll pay for the damage, how much is it? And she has the resources to pay for that because she's not taxed to the gills and she's you know, not working. You know, there's not all these other fees and charges. She's not having to pay for electricity. She's got the money to say, okay, it's gonna cost $1,000 to fix your car. I've got that, here's your $1,000. That's how a republic works. In, in a democracy, how it works is you have limited liability, you have insurance, and the insurance companies pay all the money. So there are a lot of differences between those two things. Now, what happened was is that in 1789, the United States went from being a republic to a democracy. And there's a lot of other details and complexities involved with that, but we became sort of a corporate state, a corporate government. Now, here's some other interesting stuff. This is out of Newsweek magazine in uh, 2008, back when Newsweek magazine still existed. It's a picture of Barack, supposed to be Barack Obama's hands putting the presidential seal on the podium and he's wearing a ring. You see that ring right there? You notice what that ring is? That ring is a Masonic signet ring. And they're telling you, they put this stuff out here, symbols matter. The symbolism of those people standing behind Trump matters, it means something. Whether you think Trump good, Trump bad, it means something. Here's Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon. This is his official Apollo 11 crew photo. What ring is he wearing? Not his wedding ring. Sorry, it's cut, a cut, it's cut off because of this, but it's a Masonic signet ring, just like Barack Obama's ring. They do this stuff all the time. Here's Buzz having brought back the 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason flag from the moon and presenting it to the high grand poobah of the Masonic Lodge in Washington, DC. He still wears it today. That's a crappy picture, but he still wears it today. Um, other things I noticed, when Trump introduced Gorsuch, he's standing in front of this lectern, this podium with the presidential seal on it. There's only one problem that I have with this. It's green. It's supposed to be blue. You go through the statutes and it says the presidential seal will be blue. The podiums are always blue. I looked and I've now seen that about 90% of the time that Barack Obama was president, it was blue, but towards the end, the last year, 2016, he started showing up with these green podiums. And it's not just color distortion. I mean, I've gone through, I've, seen, I've watched live television, I've watched videotape, I've gone on YouTube. Um, about half the time, the presidential podium is green. Now, what does this mean? I don't know exactly. I think the green. I think when it's in, in, in the, the green lectern, I think he's speaking as a representative of the republic. I think when it's blue, that's the color of the democracy. But there's something going on with it. I did distort the color on this one so you could see it clearer. But that kind of stuff's going on. It's really weird. Now, after the inauguration, there's the inaugural parade, which is mostly a military parade. A bunch of people, you know, different units and and um, 
uh, different bands and things go by the White House and his parade down 16th a uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. And at the end of it, they have fireworks. Traditionally, they have a concert, they have the parade, they have fireworks. And when the fireworks went off, I was quite interested to see that the fireworks did not say USA. They said USR. This is a screen cap from CNN. And you can see it. I, there, I enhanced it. See, that's an R. And so what I think that means is that somebody is wanting to replace the democracy that we've had for over 100 years, the democracy being the corporate government with a republic. And how they will do that and what their agenda is and how that will look, I do not know. I just know that some weird stuff is going to go down and has been going down. I mean, we have this thing where we had what? Um, I think there's been 145 or even more than that child trafficking arrests going on, the pedophilia stuff that, that goes on in Hollywood. That's the next thing that's going to break in Hollywood, is that there's a lot of that child sex trafficking going on in Hollywood and in Washington, D.C. And you know, I'm not going to name any names about the people in Washington, D.C., but trust me, they're on both sides of the aisle. I'm not going to name Joe Biden, John McCain. I'm not going to name any of those names as people that are involved in this. But it's on both sides of the aisle. And I think that, what's, that when that stuff comes out, it's going to really be shocking to us, just how corrupt and horrible this uh, um, alliance is. Now, what other stuff is going on that's weird symbolic stuff? OK, there is apparently an episode of a TV show called Trackdown in the 1950s. It was a Western. And one episode features an enemy, a, a bad guy, named Trump. And Trump goes to the town and he convinces all the people that guess what? They need to build a wall around their town to protect them, not from the Indians, but from cosmic rays coming from space. Trump is going to build a wall to protect us from cosmic rays coming from space. That's literally the plot of this TV show. Now you can say that's a coincidence, somebody made that up, I don't. After all these years, I don't buy that for a second. So I begin, I think, that what's happening is going to have something to do with disclosure, aliens, revelation in the long run. Now, one other thing I find out I did not know, I just found this out recently, I didn't put it in the, haven't put it in the slideshow yet, is that um, <clears throat> you guys know who Nikola Tesla is, right? Brilliant engineer, physicist, OK. When he died, he, we all kind of know the story that his apartment was pretty much ransacked by the FBI. All of his papers were taken. And unlike the Kennedy assassination papers, they remain classified to this day. OK. Anybody want to take a wild guess at the name of the lead FBI agent who went to that apartment and seized those papers? John Donald Trump. Donald Trump's uncle is the one who removed those papers. So something's going on. That's all I'm saying is something's going on. Now, there's all kinds of things that go on that they don't tell us, but that are right in front of our faces. This is Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada. Okay, And we know he disagrees with Trump on things, and there's been some issues. Handsome, good-looking young guy. He's the son of Fidel Castro. He's not the son of Pierre Trudeau. He looks nothing like Pierre Trudeau. This is Fidel Castro. That is Justin Trudeau, and that is... Maggie Trudeau, who is, can I put this nicely, a woman who, you know, had a lot of boyfriends. Had a lot of boyfriends. Didn't, wasn't faithful to her husband. Don't believe me? Okay, fine. Don't believe me. Just look at the pictures. Snopes, of course, says this is false. Justin Trudeau and Fidel Castro, you put that beard on that guy, they're the same guy. Um, here are the three of them. Look at the eyes, the nose, the smile, the lips. This is my personal favorite, is this one. <laughs> okay, it's the same guy. He's, just, he's Fidel Castro's son. So, and of course, I don't have any good pictures of Angela Merkel in here, the German chancellor, or whatever she is. Is she a chancellor still? Is that what she is? Yeah. President? She's Adolf Hitler's granddaughter. Just put, just put the little stash on her. She looks exactly like Adolf Hitler. <laughs> um, there, is, there is a Congressman Crowley. A Congressman Crowley. You guys know who Aleister Crowley is? Okay, he was a Satanist, kind of an occultist from the 30s and 20s, 30s and 40s. He's in, mentioned in the book Dark Mission. It is a whole big thing about Aleister Crowley and his influence on the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in NASA. This guy is his great-grandson, I think. And of course, there's a rumor that Barbara Bush is actually his daughter, 
President Bush's wife is actually Aleister Crowley's daughter. You look at them side by side. Oh, by the way, I was going to say my favorite rumor about Trump is that um, there are two Donald Trumps. One is a <laughs> transgender uh, girl who is now a guy who's managed to father three or four kids that look exactly like him. Okay, uh, all right. Um, and that, and the other rumor is that is that when he wears a red a red tie, red tie Trump is the real Trump. Blue tie Trump is a clone Trump. The secret space program cloned him, and the clone Trump is easier to control. So when they want him to just be nice, they send out clone Trump with the blue tie, and when they want him to be really mean, they send out red tie Trump. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, what about when Trump wears like a silver tie? Because you know, I don't know which one he is when he does that. Okay, um, so what I was gonna show you is some other pictures. If you look at Chelsea Clinton, for instance, Chelsea Clinton does not look like Bill Clinton. She does not look like Hillary Clinton very much. She is the spitting image of a guy named Webb Hubble. And do we know who Webb Hubble is, anybody? Webb Hubble was a, uh, one of the Arkansas Mafia that Bill Clinton brought with him to Washington in 1992, close confidant of the Clintons wrote a book about his time in the White House. He was like in his deputy chief of staff. He's also the guy, and if you look at their pictures, Chelsea Clinton and Webb Hubble, they look exactly alike. And Webb Hubble's daughter and Chelsea Clinton look like twin sisters. And, um, and he, when Bill Clinton took office, you probably don't remember this, but there was a story that went around the regular mainstream news that said um, that Bill Clinton pulled Webb Hubble into the, the Oval Office one of the first two or three days and said, Find out if there are aliens and find out who killed JFK. That's the job he gave him. So again, there's all these connections to this weird stuff. And I think that, um, I think that ultimately, well, I keep waiting for that. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that there's so many things out there that we haven't been told the truth about. And what's going to happen is over the next five, six, seven years, we're going to start being told the truth about it. Now, the other thing I hear, I understand, is that, is that Trump supposedly is going to play out this role, serve a certain time, and then he's gone. He's going to walk away. Once this republic thing becomes public, then there's no need for him anymore. We're going to have new elections. We're going to reelect everybody. Ryan's going to be out. Schumer's going to be out. Pence is going to be out. All these people are going to resign and walk away, that he agreed to just play this role. I, I look at the guy, and I, I see a guy with a huge ego. And I can't, I can't see him just saying, ah, oh, well, thanks. You know, I was part of a big scam. I'm walking away. I can't see him doing that. So we'll wait and see on that. So um, the other thing I wanted to talk about and show you slides of is the, uh, the Gaia mummy. Anybody seen the alien mummies from Peru? A few of you? Not everybody? I I'm surprised. Yeah, I've seen them. So back in um, May, they came out with this, um, this movie called Unearthing Nazca, which you guys may have seen. And on it was this mummy that they have named Maria. And they did not directly say, this is an alien, but they certainly implied that it was an alien. Um, I'm watching the video. There's two people involved with it that I wished were not involved with it for two different reasons. One is a female producer I've had dealings with who is a not an honest person. I don't trust her farther than I can throw her, which is not very far. The other one is a guy named Jay Widener, who I used to be good friends with. Jay used to be, Jay used to work with Richard C. Hoagland before I did. So we used to be kind of buddies and we've always talked about different things over the years. And Jay told me at Contact in the Desert last year in May that he was on top of the greatest discovery in human history. And then a month later, this video comes out, right? Now, if you've seen the video, and hopefully we can get some pictures of it here. Um, the video comes out and the first thing I notice is that the mummy, if you've seen it, is like white, okay? It's not like a regular mummy wrapped in bandages and brown and dark. It's just white, like it got spray painted, okay? So like that thing looks like it's been spray painted. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is that the scientific investigation the guy conducted, uh, as they pulled the mummy out for the first revelation, they pulled it out of a cardboard box. So the greatest discovery in human history an alien mummy has been kept for God knows how long in Peru on a rooftop. It was actually on the rooftop of a building in a cardboard box. So I was immediately a little bit skeptical of this. And, 
as I put it out there, I'm like, you know, guys, I just don't really think this is probably a mummy. As further things have developed, what they've found is that there are, uh, they're claiming to be other mummies. There's these other little mummies that are about this big that Jaime Masson has been involved with, and he, they look like E.T. They got the big E.T. head, they got the E.T. round eyes. They're much smaller, they appear to be something different. Um, and do you guys remember Jaime Masson from the mummy thing from two years ago? Two years ago, there was this mummy that Jaime found, a picture of it in Mexico, claiming it was one of the alien bodies from Roswell. It turned out to be a picture of a human mummy from, I think, Mexico in 19, like 1982 or 1992. It was a 20-year-old picture of a mummy. All, all that they had to do was they took the picture, and there was a sign there, and somebody just enhanced the sign, and you could see that it said, Mummy found in Mexico in 1982, human mummy. And they did, you know, and so Richard Dolan and Don Schmidt kind of got into a lot of career trouble for endorsing that with Jaime. Jaime's not really the most thorough researcher out there. And so he's the guy behind this. Now, it turns out what the timeline is is this. Somebody comes to um, Jaime Masson, in, in spring of this year, like April, and says, I have mummies that I found in a tomb in Peru, in Nazca, that I think are alien. Do you want to see them? And Jaime says, sure, I want to see them. I'm into alien mummies. So he gets involved. Another French researcher named Thierry Jamin gets involved. They both start looking at this, and then Gaia catches wind of it, and Gaia comes in and starts pumping all kinds of money into this and creates their video series. Now, their video series has been very successful. They have, um, yeah, we're done. It's not going to work. They have um, they've added six million dollars in revenue since they started putting out these videos. In terms of because the guy is a membership based system, it's a streaming membership based system. Since they started putting these videos out, I've been a harsh critic of it. Um, they've since blackballed me from a couple of conferences that I've been speaking at for ten years. Not this one, fortunately, and um, and so they're you know they're like all in on the mummy thing. Well, the bottom line on any of this stuff is DNA testing. There's some really weird features on Maria. She's got three fingers instead of five, they've x-rayed it, they've gone through it and through it and said, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're pretty sure this is not normal. But then if you hold up a human, an x-ray of a human hand side by side to this alien hand, what you can see is that all they've done is they've, they've sliced off the pinky finger and sliced off the thumb. And the other, otherwise the bone structure is exactly the same. So there's these kinds of issues. Um, the eyes are very round, they're not alien looking eyes, and they're saying it doesn't have any ears. Well, ears, over the time period, I think it's about 1,400 years old, these mummies are, um, they will desiccate. Or you can also cut ears off very easily. They're not very, very hard thing to, um, to remove. And other people have since found a bunch of other mummies in museums in Peru, which are 100% identified as human, which have three fingers and their ears cut off. It's a, it was a ritual thing that the, that the Nazca people, or the people of the, of the Nazca time did back 14, 1,500 years ago. And the Peruvians are not really happy about this because what happened was is that samples were taken from Maria and from the other smaller mummies and they've been sent out of the country. Well, that is an international crime. That is, the, 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 these human, first of all, they're human remains. They're biological in nature, which means you're basically sending off human remains, human waste to another country, which is a violation of environmental laws. And the Peruvians have very specific laws set up that say, you know, you cannot remove cultural artifacts from our country without this government's permission. So um, Jaime and Thierry Jamin did this. Maybe some of the people at Gaia did it. And they went and had these things tested. Now, there's different levels of DNA testing. The first one is, is fairly basic, but it can give you a reliable result once the DNA is sequenced. And it's a really a complicated thing. I actually, I would recommend a guy named Lloyd Pye. If you look up Lloyd Pye, L-L-O-Y-D-P-Y-E, look him up on YouTube, get his presentation on the star child skull, which uh, I think um, Tom has a picture of back there. You bring that stuff, um, go and look at his video presentation from 2011 from the UFO Congress, and he will explain how DNA testing is done in a very straight, straight up way. But there's basically three levels. So the first two samples that Jaime and Thierry Jamin sent out of the country were sent to a lab in, I want to say, Canada. And they came back 100% human. So here's the thing. If the sample comes back 80% human, you can say, OK, it's worth doing the more expensive mitochondrial DNA, which traces back the female path, or the nuclear DNA, which really gets deep down into the, into the cells and the nuclear DNA and, and what the makeup of the, the creature is or the person is. But if it's 100%, there's no point in doing that because it's 100% human. 
So the initial samples on some of the smaller mummies were that they were 100% human. Now what's happening is that Jaime Masson is going around at different conferences saying, well, the new samples came back and they're only 30% human. That means 70% of the DNA is non-human, which means it could be alien, right? Yeah, no, or, or it could be bacterial DNA, because that's non-human too. The report that was done by, that I got a hold of, the Spanish language report that my friend, I have a friend in Peru who got the report back, they, conduct, they, they looked at it and they said, 30% of the human was sequenced as DNA, the other 70% was not sequenceable, it was damaged, or it was contaminated with bacteria. So they're saying the other 70% is completely normal. It also says this is very common for samples of this type. So there's this whole cottage industry of um, people in Peru that are making fake alien mummies, cutting them up to make them look, finding mummies, finding real mummies, cutting them up to making them look more like aliens and then selling them to people. And the reason why this is important to me and why I think it should be important to all of us in the community is because it makes us look stupid. It makes us look like idiots to believe in this stuff or to even really seri seriously consider it. And if this was a real scientific investigation, they would do all their work in the background, not put out YouTube videos about it, and give us the results when it was all over. Even, even if it was their human, it would have been a fascinating story to tell on YouTube. It wouldn't have given them quite as much publicity as, as this. So um, this kind of gets under my skin and upsets me. I don't want you to think I'm completely negative on everything, but these two issues have been coming up, and, and I just think we ought to be super cautious about what's presented. Now, Gaia has served a certain purpose, I think, in promoting certain speakers, but they also have a lot of stuff on there that they can't really support. So I would just say, you know, caveat emptor. On, on anything coming from the Gaia folks. So I don't have the rest of my slideshow presentation. I do other things. I talk about aliens, abductions, TV shows, ancient artifacts on the moon, ancient artifacts on Mars, the face on Mars, secret societies in NASA, secret societies in government. I, I think if you guys don't mind, without the slideshow, I'll just turn it over to you. I mean, uh, actually, you know, um, Travis is gonna have to come up here pretty soon. So let, why don't we just talk about for a while what you guys wanna talk about? Anybody? Yeah. Um, Congress passed a bill to create the uh, Space Corps as the sixth military branch, and they're waiting for Trump to sign it. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I noted that I'm I'm surprised he hasn't signed it yet, unless unless his uh, unless his objective is something along the lines of what I think, which is that he's not signing it until the Republic is in place. So it's the Republic Space Corps, not the Corporation Space Corps. Um, I, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's about time. Um, and I think it indicates, I mean, if you look at the tea leaves, the way I'm kind of looking at it, what I present, was able to present to you guys, what I see is a pattern where, where the old government's going to be replaced by this new government, which is hopefully less corrupt, and then they're going to turn our attention outward to space. That's kind of the impression I'm getting. We've been basically on hold now since um, 2008 when we stopped doing manned launches, 2008, 2009, and we don't really have a space program now. So the thing that I find curious is why is NASA's budget still the same as it was if we aren't actually launching anything into space? And they have ways that they spend it, they have things they talk about that they spend it on, but so um, I, I think it's you know interesting that we're developing Starfleet, basically. We'll see what happens. Because there's, there's rumors that one of the things the Republic is going to bring in is all the secret hidden technology. That's what my book, Hidden Agenda, was going to be about. What I was going to talk to you about was, you know, have we had, have we had flying saucer technology for a long time? And my conclusion was probably since about 1958. Because there was a lot of interest and fascination in anti-gravity technology up until that point, especially when flying saucers started showing up. When flying saucers started showing up, all of a sudden the government was like, well, we got to get some of this stuff. We got to get this anti-gravity drive. We got to get this faster than light stuff. And if you look at the if you look at the curve of the speed of transportation, what you can see is that it starts with just a man walking. You know, what's the fastest a human being can run? About 22 miles an hour. Isn't that what Bob Hayes was back in the day? And not most of us can't run that fast, especially if we're carrying armor or something. And then it became the horse, and the horse and buggy. And then the next step was probably the steam train, get us up into the 30s, 35 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. The steam train, 
the automobile, the propeller airplane, the jet airplane, and the chemical rocket. So if you were to chart that on a graph, what you see is you start here in about 1850 with just a man riding a horse, and then you go straight up like this until 1960. And then the curve goes completely flat. So for the last 70 years, we have had no new breakthroughs in transportation, according to the public information that we've been given. Now, trend curves in science do not do that. They do this. And if you look at the 1950s, what you can see is that there's all this literature talking about, um, talking about the fact that we are working on developing anti-gravity, which would take us to that next step. And in 1958, it just gets cut off and disappears. Now, when, it get, when does it get cut off? It gets cut off right after a man named T. Townsend Brown makes a presentation to the US Naval Department and says, I want to build an American flying saucer. I can control gravity with electricity, with super hypercharged electrical currents on top of disc-shaped plan forms. I can make stuff go faster than light if we amp up the power enough. And the government says, oh, thanks very much. You know, that's the end of the anti-gravity research. So it's intermittent. So um, why don't we just keep going with questions and see what we can do here? OK, just a sec. Go ahead. Thoughts on Robert David Steele? Um, Robert David Steele, I don't really know him or what his story is. Can you fill me in? Yeah, I, um, I guess he was a CIA. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, um, yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll try it. We might, we might yet get done here. Um, yeah. Well, those are all stories, and they're good stories, but they're just stories, you know? I mean, Corey Good stuff is really fascinating, but it's just a story, and it doesn't have anything to support it. And, you know, I mean, Corey, I've met Corey a couple times, and I think he's a really nice guy, and he seems really sincere. And so I don't, I'm not, and there's a lot of people that rip on him, mostly because, you know, he has bigger crowds than those people do. So it's like, you know, um, but I, I mean, I think what we have two levels of this going on now, which is that, um, we have some people that are kind of nuts and bolts, more like me, more like Dolan, that are like, what can we actually conclude from what we know for a fact to be true versus the, the really out there kinds of stories, you know? I mean, I will say this, I've been, I, I used to work in Redondo Beach where Andy Basiago says he teleported to Mars and I've been in that building and there sure isn't any teleporter in there now, I'll tell you that, it's not there, it's, that's not what's in that building. So, um, you know, I, I, I would say that, um, it's important for us to continue to take this whistleblower stories with a grain of salt, and then it's up to the rest of us, the ground guys, you know, the grunts, I guess, to see what we can prove. And that's what I wanted to do with Hidden Agenda, which is to, to say, okay, what about all this fanciful stuff can we actually put our fingers on and say maybe there really is stuff? And my conclusion was that, yeah, we got flying saucer technology. And I, and I could even, if we can get the computer going, um, I'll show you some videos of NASA taking pictures of some of our, what I'm convinced are our flying saucers operating in space. And if you go to, if you guys go to, um, if you go to Contact in the Desert out there, out there in uh, Joshua Tree, you know, Jimmy Church and a bunch of other people are always out there like, oh, I saw a UFO last night. And I'm like, really, what direction was it from? Oh, oh, that way over there. Yeah, you know, right over there is a US naval weapons, it was US military weapons testing facility. And I have seen some crazy stuff, some weird craft, and it's all our stuff, you know. Look, I, my philosophy is like this. If it's shaped, if you see a flying saucer, if you see something, if it's shaped like a disc, it's probably one of theirs. If it's shaped like a Dorito, it's probably one of ours. That's just the way it works in the military. So, ma'am, yeah. Yes, um, I've come across some articles about just before Barack Obama left office, him and John Kerry went down to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And Buzz Aldrin went down there. Mm -hmm. And had a heart attack and came running back with his tail between his legs. What do you know about Antarctica? 
Well, okay. I don't. In terms of what do I know, I don't. Um, I don't know more than you've heard. Okay, I have heard the same stories you have. I have heard Obama went there. I've seen no evidence that Obama went there. We do know that John Kerry went there on election day. Um, we do know that the Germans were down there before the war, before World War II, trying to find something. And we know that they were fanatical about artifacts and things like that. And it, really, why would the Germans need the Nazis? Why would they need a base in Antarctica? It doesn't make any sense. It was about as far away from Europe and the European war as anything could be. So um, another thing that was going to be in my presentation about Hidden Agenda, the book, is that you know we did send Operation High Jump down there right after the war. As soon as the war in Europe was over, the first thing we did was invade Antarctica. With a sizable military force, it came back way uh, ahead of schedule, way earlier than it was supposed to, leaving all the expensive equipment behind, pretty much, the heavy equipment. And the rumor has always been that the Germans kicked our butts with flying saucers. Now, one of the things I did put together, too, is that, yeah, they were working on the flying saucers. They absolutely were. They were working on propulsion systems. The, the Nazi Bell, I think, is an anti-gravity reactor that could make a saucer-shaped platform basically defies the, the laws of physics. So all that stuff, to me, makes a, a certain degree of sense, and I can't really argue against it. And of course, there's the rumors that they found underground entrances. They found entrances to you know the uh, inner Earth. And this whole inner Earth thing, it, it does seem a bit silly. But the fact is, is that there is plenty, plenty of volume in terms of space down there for there to be multiple civilizations underneath our planet. Technologically very advanced living under there. I am able to play some of your video. I won't play the... Uh, won't play the PowerPoints? Uh, well, no. Like I said, Open Office doesn't recognize it. Okay. That's too bad. Um, okay, so why don't we show... Why don't we show some of our alien derived UFO technology in action. Why don't you go grab that STS-48 abrupt turn UFO footage, that one right there. Double click on that one, we'll run it. Okay, so if you don't know what this is, this is famous. This is a space shuttle mission STS-48. It is taking place near Australia. The shuttle is moving night into day. And what you're seeing on the screen is the camera, camera out the back of the shuttle, looking back along the path. You're seeing stars up here in the sky. And the motion of the shuttle coming this direction, coming towards the screen, is making these stars, and I think there might be a planet here, appear to descend in the background. These are city lights below. There's a thunderstorm of some kind going on here. And there are also these other objects which are above the clouds that are tumbling and they're moving kind of casually around the screen. That, we don't know exactly what that is, is some kind of camera mark. Now, inter interesting thing to really point out here. This is what's called the airglow limb of the Earth. That is the top of the atmosphere. The actual physical horizon is right here. So that space is the atmosphere. Now, what you're going to see in a second is you're going to want to focus right here in the middle of the screen. And you're going to see an object pop into the screen, up over the horizon, move to its left. Then you're going to see a flash. Boom. It changes direction at 45 degrees, accelerates, and there's a shot goes by there and another shot goes by there. And other objects also change direction. Now, it's important to appreciate several things about this. First of all, um, is there a little boy here? Okay, cover his ears. Shit can't change direction in space. Okay, it can't. Unless something acts on it, it cannot change direction. Um, so when that thing made a 45 degree turn, and if you, can you rewind a little bit and go back to that pot spot again? When it made that 45 degree angle turn, or 60 degree angle turn, at, it, it accelerated to, oh gosh, I want to say, I don't know that I remember the exact number, about 23,000 miles an hour. It was the equivalent of the acceleration of dropping a 14 story building on your head. So nothing inside of a craft, a conventional craft, could have survived that. Yet, uh, it appears something did. Now, 
Um, the other thing that's been checked on, there's been a lot of debates about this. Some people say the flash is actually just a Werner thruster going off, Vernier thruster going off on the shuttle. Again, I had a friend, uh, L. Blaine Hammond, who's an, uh, an Apollo, not an Apollo, but a uh, space shuttle pilot, watched this video and he said, no, that flash is completely abnormal. We have nothing like that. It never looks like that in space. We never see that. Whatever this flash is, coming up right about there, it is something outside the shuttle, and there is one shot and two shots. Now, where this took place is right over the Pine Gap CIA facility in Australia. So this was some kind of space-based or ground-based space weapon to fend off UFO technology. And as you can see, it was a piece of cake for our little flying saucer to make a right-hand turn and escape with its life. The other thing that's really important about this video is that not only is uh, Dr. Jack Hasher, a physicist from Nebraska, University of Nebraska, has charted all these things. A lot of these other objects change directions, but the main one, the star, actually comes to a complete stop for almost one full Discovery second before Houston it... For JO. Before that's, that's NASA commentary. Before it, um, before it turns right. Again, something that cannot happen in space. In space, it's weightless, it's frictionless, essentially. So that was a powered vehicle that was fired upon by something that nobody in NASA has ever seen before, and it changed direction and zipped away. That's the technology that we should have had from about the 1960s on. And then it continues to do a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so why don't we close this one down and then pull the other video up, the SCS-80 video. And this one was several years later, but what I want you to do is watch at the very beginning I think it's right around in here. You're going to see something really extraordinary. This is the city of Santiago, Chile at 33 degrees. Just watch. Just keep. Yeah, what was that? Okay, can you rewind that real quick? This is something launched from the ground into space. some sort of electromagnetic weapon or tadpole flying off into space, okay? Now we can move forward a little bit. Why don't we move forward like right about here, I think. Right about there. Keep going, yeah, keep going a little bit. Keep going. Again, we've got the same situation, the air glow layer, the actual physical horizon. We've got stars and stuff moving back. This is a thunderstorm taking place in front of the camera. Big, bright object. Okay, so what we want to do is rewind back to about here. Well, yeah, right there. Stop right there. Let it go. Okay, so what you're going to see is as they're in close-up, you're going to see an object come from the right into the field of view, and it's going to hit the clouds, and it's going to flare up in kind of a giant static electrical charge. What's that thing in the upper right going? Uh, what? That other stuff? That other stuff oh, that was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can I rewind that? Uh, sure. sure. Yeah. You remember, this is kind of primitive camera technology. It's from the 1990s. So you guys saw what I saw too, yeah. correct? Yeah, we yeah, saw. Yeah, there's a little dot like in the clouds. Okay, that was that was a streak of something. There's there's a, an object moving slowly, and the thing about these that you know NASA's argument is that a lot of these are ice crystals. Well, okay, one of the things is in space you can't change speed. If you look at that, it slows down. That means it's a powered vehicle. So thunderstorms, lightning. They're zoomed up, and now here comes this guy. And he's going to hit the atmosphere, and wow, huge electrical static discharge. Notice what happens, too. It's slowing down. Now it's almost completely stopped. Now it's matching speed with the space shuttle, because it appears to be stationary. Remember, the space shuttle's moving. So it's now station keeping with the shuttle. So it's changed once again its actual speed. This is a powered vehicle in Earth orbit. It's going to just stay there for a while. <clears throat> Still. 
still stays there. Still station keeping. Came to a point up above the clouds or in the clouds and just stopped. Again, other objects all over the place scattering around. Some of them could be ice crystals. Oh, there's another one. Now suddenly this guy starts to move again, or the shuttle accelerates or something because it starts to move back this way. This guy, meanwhile, is slowing down. Here's another one, tumbling, blinking, something. Now he's actually no longer station keeping and drifting away. He's actually moving back along the path he came. This object is moving too, might be a star. See how this guy slowed down, this tumbling guy. There's another one. Notice how they're going to have a little meeting out here, these three. That is a star. These are powered objects. So this thing has come into the, the view of the camera, flared up, slowed down, station kept with the shuttle, and now is moving back along the direction in which it came. It's interesting that they're focusing on it, too. Right, from, the, from Mission Control in Houston. Now they zoom up, they're trying to get a better look. We'll zoom back out, they're still blinking. This is our main guy that came in way back before, he's now kind of cutting out. So again, NASA can say anything they want about these, but the only thing that can maneuver like this are powered vehicles. Also, I don't think ET is gonna get on the phone and call NASA and say, by the way, we're going to be at right over Santiago, Chile at 33 degrees at, you know, 07, 08, 100 hours. Why don't you guys have your cameras ready? These were tests done by the shuttle to photograph our own secret space program technology. I'm convinced both of them were. One of them was a weapons test. One of them was just a maneuvering test. And then it gets really kind of uh, boring after this. It'll keep going for a while. Um, so that's, to, to me, that is solid visual evidence of powered vehicles operating in space, probably controlled by us, and probably a technology that's been suppressed uh, from us for years and years and years. So, okay, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, do you think that along with the disclosure of extraterrestrials, do you think that there's potential for the disclosure of extraterrestrials to be the human race to be more accurate, such as, uh, I know a feeling Yeah. Do you think that our origins will be really revealed to us as well? You know, I think I think they'll be my just my opinion. I think they'll be illuminated. I don't think we're ever going to know. I think that we're so we've been so manipulated genetically for so long that I I don't think anybody really knows what the truth is, and I I don't think the aliens are telling the truth. I mean, you read all the Sitchin stuff. Everything that Sitchin puts in there is contingent upon. The Sumerians, the gods, the Anunnaki telling him the truth. What if this is, you know, look, if you come, if you really, if Anunnaki really existed, and I think that they did, and I think that, um, did we, did we, no, it, it's done? Okay. And I think that, I, I have doubts about whether they were physical giants. I'm not sure about that part of it. But, I mean, think about it like this, you know, Shaq, going back in that time period when people were about five feet tall would have really seemed like a giant, but he wouldn't necessarily have been, you know, not the Michael Tellinger 18 feet tall with the footprint that's, you know, how big is that footprint, 10 feet tall? That's a whole different thing. But um, I just think it's like, if you, if you came here, you saw that there was already a humanoid species here, maybe you broke the rules and you, you know, had some of the women, like the Bible says, you weren't supposed to be doing it, and then your bosses came back, and <laughs> well, you made a real mess of this place, didn't you? All I'm saying is, whatever agenda they're gonna put forth is going to be their version of reality that's gonna make them look the best. So whatever information we, are to, we might put out, or might get put out during disclosure about our true history is gonna be, I think, somebody's version of reality and not necessarily a reality that, that we can count on. 
you know? I mean, I, the other thing that most people don't know about Sitchin is that the first book, The Twelfth Planet, he did write from his interpretations of, of, of the cylinder seals. And everything after that was um, channeled, he says, from Enki. He, he says, and told many people this, including a person I know very well, um, that he got a visit from Enki, who is still alive, and who is now, looks like us, no longer has the ZZ Top beard, and that, that some of them, that some of the Anunnaki have remained here, they have, made, they have altered their genetics to look like us so they can fit in with us, and that they are here trying to clear up the, the messed up karma that they created, you know, 100,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. So that's, that's what other people say. Sitchin did admit, though, to multiple people that Enki just told them all. This is like interview with an Anunnaki. You know, like remember the book Interview with a Vampire? That's what, it, that's what it really is. And the best book to really figure out, to find out what Enki's version of the story is, I guess, would be the, um, the Lost Book of Enki, which is published as, as a historical fiction. But, but Sitchin has told my friend that, no, that's just everything Enki told him about what really happened. So that's a that's a really good book, and I, put, I there's a lot of excerpts from that book in my book, the in the Secret Societies book. I put a lot of that stuff in here. So um, I think yeah, we're going to get some version of our history, but I don't know what it is. And the other thing too is don't get caught up in your body. I mean, really, all we are is this, these physical bodies are a container for a spirit, right? For something higher than that. And I think that's what's really not touchable. And how will they modify our bodies? Here and there, I don't think I don't think it really matters so much. You know, when they talk about the origin of man, is that really the origin of man? Where do, you know where do you draw the line? They just found they just found some teeth in Europe the other day, which indicates that the whole idea that of Lucy, this this early humanoid skeleton from Africa, it, it is probably wrong because this was 9.7 million years old, and they're human teeth in Europe. So maybe mankind originated from Europe. I mean, we don't know. And I think that I think there's been a lot of species here for a long time messing around with us a lot. Um, and I, but I do, I do think that the part about, you know, we shall make man in our own image, the Anunnaki version, I think we probably do resemble them very closely. So they're, they're you know, but I don't think that conflicts with, with, um, with Christian mythology at all, really. It's just a di slightly different version. Yes, sir. Because um, you've written books about moon and Mars and all these arguments that I've been Buildings and ruins, yeah. Pyramids. Um, and Elon Musk was talking about like in 2024, you might have people yeah. on Mars. Yeah. And my question to you is since you've done probably vast research on it, is, you know, what do you think the purpose of the moon is? You know, some people say it's an artificially created place, mm -hmm. like an actual planet. And, um, you know, if we have this type of technology, have we been going there? And what is the purpose of the moon in actuality? And yeah. what are they using? Yeah, you guys, have you guys ever seen the videos of Elon Musk where he appears to be completely coked up during interviews and stuff? Where they like, like you know, enters Elon Musk and he turns, he's like, "Oh, am I on stage?" You know, and, and then and then they cut in the clip where he's like, "You know, you could you could ship you know 500 pounds of crack cocaine to Mars." You know, and I'm like, he wants to go to Mars. He wants to ship crack cocaine there, but he's not coked out. That's what he says. I don't know. Um, I just, no, I mean, you, there's a couple of great videos if you watch it, and it's just how incoherent he's like, he's like, well, people say, why go to Mars? And then he kind of like stares off and goes, well, why go anywhere? You know, oh, yeah, that, that was inspiring, JFK too. Um, so the moon. Um, yeah, I've written a book in, in, the, in my moon book, which I actually have the most copies of back there, Ancient Aliens on the Moon. Um, one of the things I cover is the fact that there are, from the soil samples that they brought back, there's what they call oxygen, um, isotopic ratios that they can look at basically and see what the origin of the moon soil dust rock is and what they found is that it is the same as the earth in other words the earth has a specific elemental signature like strontium 90 um, on earth is slightly different than strontium 90 you would find on mars and you you know that you can tell the difference by getting samples and you would say to yourself okay so we know that this strontium 90 element came from mars it did not come from the earth Every single one of the moon's elements that have been analyzed are all the same as the Earth. So my theory is, at least Tom, Dr. Tom Van Flander is a guy named Dr. Tom Van Flander, the late Dr. Tom Van Flander, I think he died in 2011, wrote a great book called Dark Matter, Missing Comets, and New Planets. It's a little dry, he was a scientist. 
but he subscribes to what he calls the solar fission theory, which is the planets do not crash into each other in this big you know, collection of dust and then somehow magically glue themselves together as opposed to destroying each other, that they're actually, what happens is the sun gets massive and starts to spin and it starts to collect all this material in an, inter in an accretion disk and then it gets spinning so fast and has so much energy that it flattens at the poles and then spews the planets out one by one. And then he's, he's got, got, goes through this whole thing in the theory, which I repeat in the book, and then the planets, the bigger ones like Earth, some of the smaller rocky ones, spin off their own moons. And so if you, if you look at that theory, which I think is correct, then the moon having those exact same ratios, isotopic ratios, makes a lot of sense. It fits very, very well with that theory. Having said that, somebody has definitely come in and modified the moon since then. So it is both. It is both a natural object that had its origin with the Earth, and it has also been completely modified. Because if you look at the stuff that's all over the surface of it and places where there are rips in the skin, you can see, <laughs> you can see like tubes, and you can see transportation, and you can see equipment, and you can see all kinds of stuff in these dark uh, recesses that, in, in various pictures. And I put a bunch of them in, in that book. So I, I have to say it's both. What I think is it's a natural object that's been modified extensively, and there's a lot of artificial stuff on it. There's, there's some craters that look like, they look like there's a big crater, Copernicus being one, and it looks like the ejecta blanket is, um, you know, is, is um, just a normal ejecta blanket of debris. And you look, and it's all roads and buildings and pyramids, and it's like, it's all artificial. It's almost like somebody made a fake crater <coughs> And built all this, built all these condos around it. It's pretty amazing. I gotta go. That's it. I'm done. One more question. One more. One more. You, sir, in the awesome alien hat, by the way. Yeah. You know what do you think about the supposed Apollo 20 mission? Yeah, actually, um, David Hatcher Childress. You guys know him from Ancient Aliens, right? Yeah. David Hatcher Childress. <laughs> um, we were on the Ancient Alien cruise last year in um, to the Caribbean. And uh, I was on it with Dave, and I'm, and we're sitting down at, having a few beers, and I go, you know, so David, what kind of ring did you buy your wife? You know, and he's like, Mike, I hear, I hear you talking very funny. What are you trying to do? And his wife says, he's doing you, Dave. He's doing you. So David doesn't know that he talks like that. Um, but uh, what the hell was the question? <laughs> Apollo 20. He wants me to do some. Uh, Apollo 20 is part of a new book, and. What I will say is this, is that um, it, this, this is not something, this is not something that would be easy to do. Um, the interiors of the lunar module are excellent. They look like a lunar module, okay? The pictures of the object are, um, they, they seem to be legitimate. Now what that object is, whether it's some sort of weird natural formation, whether it's a real spaceship or not, I don't know. The mummy, I'm not so sure about. As you know, I have a problem with mummies, um, as I just established. So I don't know what to make of that video. I would say I, it's still open, but I mean, the interior, to get the interior of the lunar module to look that accurate is a really difficult thing to do. The only other time it's been done was the um, um, Apollo movie that came out a few years ago where they did a super great detailed job of it. But why would you spend that kind of money on a free YouTube video? See, this is one thing I want to leave you with. You know, that people say there, there's people arguing about hoaxes, like MJ-12 is a hoax, okay? Well. Really, they, they put these papers out in 1984, and there's been other subsequent papers that have come out. Serpo.org, you remember that one? Everybody's like, oh, that's a hoax. You know, all the old school UFO people, oh, that's a hoax, it's all phony. Go through serpo.org serpo sometime. That's like, that's like as big as Gone with the Wind, or War and Peace, or the Urantia book. Somebody spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of their lives creating this thing. Why would you do that for free? Why would you do that and give it away for free? And isn't the point of a hoax to be, oh, I'm gonna make a hoax about, now I'm gonna make a hoax that I went to, the, I went to Mars and teleported and I'm gonna put out all this proof and, you know, isn't the point of it is that you get all the people to believe it and then you come out and you say, ha ha, just fooling, you're a bunch of dummies, I tricked you. I, so as far as the Apollo 20 thing goes, if it was an absolute fake, we would, we would know about it by now. That's my opinion, so. All right, guys, thank you. I'm sorry about the slideshow, technical problems. I apologize. Thanks for coming.